Let's see. And we are we are live. We are live on How It Bring Up Gavin. Yeah, it worked. It worked. And yeah, I haven't done one of these in a little bit of a while. I think it's been about a month. Uh, the last one I did was with Elle McNichol a month ago. So I'm just like getting back into the swing of things a bit. So today I am joined by author extraordinaire Ross Montgomery, who is well he's done a lot he's he has done a lot and we'll talk about that um but ross you want to quickly introduce yourself to the viewers who yeah. are just tuning in now oh go on then uh, yes hello uh, I'm ross <laughs> uh i am a children's author uh, and i like to write um i would say weird and wonderful books for children uh first one came out in 2013 which was alex the dog on the op unopenable door which i still can't pronounce after all this time uh and <laughs> you wrote it but is called the midnight guardians uh which just came out a couple of weeks ago this one here look he's got one this yeah i, I should have like 1500 of them it's such a fantastic book and i do want to say to everybody watching if you haven't read the book yet don't worry we won't be spoiling any of like the big plot points or anything yeah we're going to be we're going to be on our best behavior so don't worry about mm. that um so a huge hello from people as well hi claire hi tamar um so uh just a little um before we get into it as well i do want to say that um i will be cc'ing this interview as well so if anybody is deaf or hard of hearing i will be doing the cc so that should be up within the next week or so it's a bit tricky with youtube now they're not really the best at supporting the whole cc situation they've changed it up a bit it's a bit weird but it'll I get done that, it'll, yeah. yeah it'll get done it's fine um but yeah so as people like more people are tuning in and things hi hannah <laughs> uh, hello maura um we are tossing actually to the midnight guardian so sorry to, you can have to raise the glass again ross <laughs> no. tossing to the midnight guardian so oh, cheers so to you ross <laughs> all of the success yeah this is for you this is for you so while more people yeah <laughs> well more people are tuning in i thought it would be fun to start off with my favorite round of icebreakers which are always fun get to learn a little bit more about you and i feel like i've got some i've, I've got some good questions here i think i think we really will learn so much more about you so i know i know don't worry about it it's fine <laughs> uh, so are you an early bird or a night owl absolutely early bird um I, I sort of without even really wanting to be it just happens um yeah. i think i i've recently i've just fallen asleep earlier and earlier and earlier like i really can't help myself it's sort of like i'd say like absolute maximum at the moment 10 p.m wow this yeah. is well this is quite late for you then i honestly it's all pajamas from like <laughs> I'm in a i mean same it's fine <laughs> uh so i mean that's fine i know like a few it's i've asked every author that question and it's been one or the other yeah. i'm waiting for the moment somebody says both like can you imagine getting up so early and going to bed so late only sleeping for what four or five hours and getting so much done during the day i envy those people i don't know how they do that was it margaret thatcher who slept for like three hours a day something like that most probably probably which uh, speaking of i think uh, the Crown has just premiered or something, uh, the mm -hmm. new season, and, and Margaret Thatcher's in that, played by Gillian Anderson. So that's oh pretty cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I need to watch that show. Uh, uh, Holly says that she's just got the book a couple of days ago. It's definitely on the December TV. Ooh. Yes, get it. It's actually, per this is a perfect book to read for like the wintry kind of, I mean, just for like the cover. If you get the the final edition, I love how the snow like is kind of Isn't reflective. It amazing? Like honestly, oh, like, I just can't believe yeah. my luck with it. It's incredible. In fact, yeah. I did something really cool. So of a couple of days ago, um, David Dean, who illustrated the front cover, he had like an early rough that he did for the front cover, and then he went with that final one. And to celebrate publication, he actually finished off the final. Um, and it's absolutely beautiful. So he sent me a printed version of it in this little Ooh. handmade envelope. There we go. Oh, I love it. I going back. And then I'll be oh. with the hand just because you guys have got to see this. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, it's I can't wait. A reboot of the front cover. And here we go. Make sure I don't damage it because I'm taking it out. This is an exclusive. 
Oh, yeah. that is gorgeous. That is it's stunning. Absolutely incredible. It sort oh of makes my god. That like um yeah. the version of the badger, Mr. Noakes, that you sort of get on the spine. I think he must have oh, gotten yeah. it from this original version. That's amazing. Yeah. That is incredible. I love that you've got that as well. You can frame it, you can hang it up. Um, oh getting rid of the but world. But now map. I kind of want that. Just doing that. I was studying that world map earlier and I learned a lot from it, so it was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful though. I'm, that was a interview exclusive we just got there, everyone. That we'll never say that again. Never say that again. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, so it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> uh, so what is your favorite season of the year? Oh, I just every single year autumn like hits and I just breathe a sigh of relief. It's just such a pleasure every time. And I don't know if it's because um, my birthday has just passed. It's in November. Oh. So maybe it's like linked to like nice childhood memories of noticing the seasons changing. But it just yeah. suits me. I don't, I'm really bad in summer. I, just, I can't do it. I just sweat and sort of feel uncomfortable. Whereas this, like sort of walking around um, that like really crisp air, it makes all the difference. I think it's brilliant. I agree because I feel like it's easier to um, warm up than it is to cool down. So during the mm -hmm. summer when it's roasting hot and you're just sitting there sticking to the sofa, it, yeah, I agree. I like it when it's cooler. I'm not having it. And also, happy belated birthday as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I hope you had a good day. How did you spend your birthday? It was honestly the first time in years that I've done absolutely nothing. And I think <laughs> that... Uh, I just got really lucky with the timing like on another week doing nothing all that day would have been really annoying and actually the day that it happened it was just all i wanted i like turn my phone off i wore a jumper that was it no you deserve it after the the yeah you've had you know and bringing out another another book so Woo. you definitely deserved it uh, also yeah i agree the artwork is stunning the illustrator yeah. top notch uh, oh, also, yeah, uh, Midnight Guardians was in the recent Tales by Mail book hey. box as well. Did they contact you about that? Did they want, were they like, hey, Ross, we really want Midnight Guardians to be part of this book box? I think, what was it? I know that it came through my publisher, um, and it's quite a new thing, isn't it, Tales by Mail? Yeah. I don't think it's been around for that long, um, and it just sounds great. Um, I think also the, what was it? So the publication date was originally supposed to be September, uh, and then yeah. it got pushed back to November. But for some reason, the Tales by Mail people still got their books like super early in like a few different schools. So like those kids got like an exclusive of maybe like two months before anyone else. That's and it so could cool. happen again. Oh, <laughs> that's so cool. Though. I love that because um, we got it in the bookshop I work in. We got it like not that much early. It must have been uh mid october and probably before then it was probably start of october i came in and we I were like it, yeah yeah and it, i mean it was fantastic because we managed to like get, like it out and on display and stuff but also we were like we can't really say it's book of the month yet because it's too early to say that um but it was still nice to have it's just i always love it especially since it was pushed back from september and it feels years ago since i read it now it really does so yeah <laughs> we definitely uh we love to say it we love to say it um so next question if you could be in any movie what movie would it be mm, any movie oh my any word. movie holy smokes yeah so this will tell us so much about your case i my <laughs> sister when we were like uh i think she would have been 12 and i was 10 became obsessed with the film clue which oh was yeah, like, yeah. Do you remember that? that it was like <laughs> what well, I've not seen it, but Elle McNichol, who I interviewed last month, she was talking about that as well. She, Are you she was like, yeah, no, I'm not talking. Honestly, she loves Clue. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I well, I've been I think about it a lot the last few days. Like, oh yeah, Tim Curry is the butler who's not actually in the board game, but like, yeah, that would yeah. be great. I th yeah, I think it would be. I I mean, I still need to watch it, but I I know of it. I've seen I've seen a clip of it. I think it's circulated on YouTube. Um, but no, that yeah, that's where do you say that? <laughs> You're on the same wavelength. It's one of those um, films they, that is like not that good, but people seem to love in quite an intense way. Ooh. Hang on a moment. Can you hear me now? 
Uh, yes. Sorry, oh, my I think my AirPods went off. Two seconds. Uh, yeah, I can definitely hear you if that helps. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, I'm just going to take these off because. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah, no, that's all perfect, mind. Awesome. Oh, what were you saying? Sorry, my AirPods just died on me. <laughs> all it was is uh, basically the film Clue. It's one of those films that people seem to really love and like has cult appeal, despite being not that good. So if you do choose to watch it at this point in your life, you're probably going to be a bit confused. Okay, so it's like a, a movie that's bad, but it's good to watch it kind of thing? Basically that. If it came on on ITV3 at 4 p.m. on like a Sunday, you'd be fine. Oh, that would have been great if it had to come on today instead of all the Christmas movies I watch. Uh, do you have any hobbies that we might not know about? <laughs> hobbies that you might not know about? I tend to talk about all of them like endlessly. Yeah. I think it used to be a lot more interesting. I used to actively cultivate them. Uh, and recently it's just come down to I've gotten quite into foraging for things like going around and trying to get as many like sweet chestnuts as I can and turn them into stuff. Um, and that's great. There's like an app you can get uh, for like just scanning flowers and plants and it tells you what they are. So, you know, like if you're going to die, if you eat them or not, which is probably quite helpful. That's been brilliant. That is handy. That is handy. Wow. I'm going to have to get this app. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I actually have done a little bit of research on you. Um, and I saw that you're, nothing to worry about. I saw that your writing heroes are Terry Pratchett and oh, Jackie yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Um, hey, what is your favourite book by Terry Pratchett yeah. and Jacqueline Wilson? Oh, my God. I would say Jacqueline Wilson. I think my... I think the best one that she's done personally, because she's, I think she's on 110, something like that now. Um, I yeah. think the illustrated mum is amazing. Um, that's been one that like revisiting it, I think has still had like as much of an impact. I know that the one that I think made the biggest sort of dent on me when I was growing up was um, Double Act, which oh. um, I've still got like a sort of hardback first edition of that. Um, I think it was even, what was it? So I don't know if it would have been the same in like subsequent reprints, but that first double act, it was, um, uh, is it Ruby and Garnet, the two twins that it's about? Their sections are illustrated by different people. And that kind of blew my mind when I was a kid. Like only, I think Ruby's section is Nick Sharrett, I want to say. Um, and then Garnet's is sort of like a much softer style. And I love that. I thought that was brilliant. And then there's Harry Pratchett. Um, it's hard to actually choose one. I think for me, it was just the Discworld series like as a whole. And I need to properly revisit that. Um, but there are so many of them that I sort of keep putting it off again and again and again. I think I would probably, I think I always really like Guards, Guards. And that sort of like the sort of Watchmen sort of side of it, that sort of Captain Vine series. I love that. That was great. So, I haven't read a Terry Pratchett book yet. And I know that's really? really shocking. Yeah, that's shocking, I know. Uh, so <clears throat> do you recommend me start off with? The one thing that I have heard people say is um, don't start from the very beginning. Like those first two are like a little, he's sort of like finding his feet a bit. Yeah. Um, the person you need to ask about this is, um, what is it? It's Lucy Lipinski, uh, who um, wrote the Strange Worlds Travel Agency. She's like a sort of uber expert at it. I think you probably have like flow charts to answer that question for you. Well, I mean, I do really want to get uh, Lucy on on here, so let's. Uh, That'd be brilliant. You should definitely. Yeah, maybe for the second Strange Worlds, that would be awesome. So mm. I'll ask them. What's the release date for that? Can you remember? April fifteenth, twenty twenty one. I think it is. Gosh, it's really knocking them out. That's amazing. I know, right? And it comes by so quick as well. Yeah, you know, just I can't believe it's almost time for like all of the 2021 releases to start up. Um, don't get me started. <laughs> Too many of them. There's so many coming out in January. My bank is just going to break all of the children's books coming out. Oh, I can't keep up. <laughs> oh, talented people. Um, yeah, right. Too many. Too many of them. Uh, what I, I also saw that. Okay, uh, it's on your website, but when you said that you put your hands in your pockets and you find empty packets of crisps and things, what is your favourite flavour of crisps? 
or is it fries in America? It entirely depends on my mood. Um, it, I would say the one that I keep coming back to, even though I know I shouldn't, even though I feel I should grow up, is Steak McCoy's. Oh, is, I can't help it. It's tragic. Not, good flavor, good strong flavor, I think. Yeah, Chef's Kiss, seriously. It's Have not. You, um, what is it? There's like uh, a thing called liquid aminos. Like, there's some like vegan soy sauce kind of thing. Have you ever heard about this? No, I haven't. It's this thing that I think uh, one of my friends is vegan and cooks loads. And he said, oh, if you want to get that kind of like meaty flavor, you use liquid aminos. And I got this bottle. It's pure Steak McCoy's flavor in a bottle. If you wanted like Steak McCoy's mouthwash, you're basically sorted. Nice. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I don't know how I really feel about that, but <laughs> I can't. Are you not delighted? I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I'll have to try it first, just like the drink that you're drinking. I'm going to have to try it first. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I feel like, okay, last one, and this one I feel requires a little bit of a story time. I also saw that you may or may not have fainted in front of the Queen, and I'd absolutely love to know what that means. <laughs> well, the nice thing, so um, what was it, the... Uh, Catherine Rundle recently curated that Book of Hopes that oh, was yeah. of 150 stories. I actually ended up writing sort of a, a short explanation of how it happened, which is oh. now in the audiobook read by Stephen Fry, which Stephen is like, I know about this. Yeah, <laughs> the best thing ever. Listening to it was just bizarre. Yeah. Um, the short explanation is that I was a chorister when I was, uh, I think, seven, eight years old. Um, and it was for a very small uh, chapel that was in Windsor Great Park that belonged to the Queen Mother. Okay. So she used to be there almost every single week. And occasionally the Queen would be there. Um, and I have a bit of a fainting problem. Back then I'd never fainted before. So any of the warning signs that you normally get, I just, I didn't know what they meant. So I was standing there singing, definitely about to faint. And rather than stopping and sitting down, I just kept going and then absolutely just like took out a kid next to me with my head. It was like full on, full on drama. <laughs> you were dedicated to the end, is what exactly. it was. You didn't want to just stop. You were like, you know what, I'm saying this through. The queen is here. <laughs> I'm going to wait for the highest note. I'm going to go out screaming. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. I, w I mean, bless you at the same time. Like, I feel like that would have been a bit traumatizing. Bless you. But yeah. It's, you know, it's nice to know when you have a lowest ebb, you know, you can go up from that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Keep climbing. Yeah. <laughs> Keep climbing. And you have, you have, as this year has proved. And that means like, that was the last um, weird icebreaker question, I promise. We'll get into some proper stuff now. Um, and feel free to blow your own trumpet. Feel free to talk. Non you know, you can be as egotistical as you want to. Is absolutely fine. Talk about yourself. This is this is your time to shine. So, <laughs> um, so you are a, a writer, children's writer. You have been for quite some time. Um, so I'm just wondering how you decided that writing was something that you really wanted to do. Like, was there a moment in your life where you were like, "Yeah, you know what? I want to." You know, it doesn't matter if it doesn't pay well. I want to write books for children. Was there ever a moment where that happened? I think um, I was one of those kids that loved writing. Like, it was just my favourite thing to do. Like, very much like a child who, like, loved reading and loved writing stories. And I think um, I cannot remember who told me this. Uh, and it was just annoying because it's a very good quote. Mm -hmm. But um, another author said that you end up writing for the age that you were when books kind of blew your head open. Mm -hmm. And I remember being 10 years old and that was around about the time that I was reading things like Terry Pratchett. And I just didn't, I'd never realized that you could do that with books where you could uh, write a story that was really silly and funny, but that was also um, uh, sort of quite serious at times and beautifully written. And I think at that point, I knew it was something that I wanted to do. I ended up um, sort of as a teenager, kind of dropping off it a bit, which I think is really common. Uh, maybe not as much nowadays, but I think back when I was a teenager, there wasn't really any anything that I felt was there for me reading wise. Um, and it wasn't really till I was about 17 that I started, um, started picking up 
almost like cult adulty fiction yeah uh, that i sort of got back into it and i wrote all through university i wrote a book with my sister for four years uh, that we didn't do anything with and then um when i became a uh teaching assistant in a primary school you still get all those holidays but all my friends were in their early 20s and were doing like full-time jobs so there was no one to spend time with uh so just in those holidays and half terms i sat down and I wrote a story uh, and that was the first one that got published uh alex the dog and the unopenable door um which yeah gosh that's almost 10 years ago now that is crazy wow it was such a journey such a journey because even like now like i have like seen your books i have heard about your books and like christmas dinner of souls every year of waterstones we always like bring it out on the christmas table oh, you know no yeah it's like a christmas tradition now almost um so yeah it's you've actually come like on such a journey and i can imagine it's been up and down for you i guess like just like this entire time as you said like 10 years you were working also as a teaching assistant so it never really came easy to you did it i think i got really lucky i think that the first proper book that i wrote got published and i was quite young when that happened so i think i was 25 when it came out um which is i i almost wasn't prepared for it i was prepared to spend 10 years you know submitting book after book after book uh, and then finally getting there um so in that respect i was i think really lucky um in the sort of i think it, over the last i don't know like seven eight years i've written quite a few books um and i think that the um the reviews have always been really nice uh critically um particularly christmas dinner of souls actually that sort of went really weirdly well have been there but i think i uh this is probably the midnight guardians is maybe the first time i've noticed just a change in the number of people that are reading it i've never sort of had that experience before i've never my twitter timeline has never been so busy of just like uh, the people reading it i'm not used to this i'm not used to people reading the book it's amazing <laughs> you used to yeah you're just like used to getting your book out in the world but not really i, I guess times have also changed because a lot of people are using Twitter and you're using Twitter and I guess just like author interaction has been a lot easier now than it was back then. Uh, I think that's really interesting. The thing that I've definitely noticed is um, I think it's very different for uh, when you write for young adults because normally by that time they're like super savvy at social media and don't need any encouragement and they'll very happily uh, like tweet you just abuse about your book or like tag you in negative reviews and whereas on twitter i'm talking to teachers and i'm talking to librarians i'm talking to booksellers but actually the only time i really talk to children who read my books is when i've been going into schools and doing those kind of visits so i'm slightly cut off from uh i guess my readership you know i suppose like you doing what you do of actually like talking to kids and parents in bookshops that's the bit that i don't really get any kind of insight into there's this weird sort of silence you throw a book out there and go yeah no i totally get it <laughs> yeah, is there anyone listening is there anyone reading no i totally get it <laughs> it must have been so weird this year as well with i mean we very briefly mentioned this before we went live actually about sort of like what you were doing during lockdown and like editing during lockdown and things but now um you like how have you found it like being a writer this year like has it been has it like given you like enough creative like outlet because you're not doing too much out in the real world you've got like a lot of yeah. time doors with your not experiencing stuff you yeah. know like all that raw material that you rely on has suddenly like closed right down i think um there was an amazing article that I read quite early on in first lockdown, which was basically going, there's a reason we're all having weird dreams. Like, just, just, to, just to clear this up, there's a reason it's happening. That um, apparently the way that your brain works is that, you know, your dreams are taking all the material from the day, turning them into like a narrative. And when your days are a little bit more samey, um, your brain has no choice but to mine its kind of like backlog of information for material so that's why those first few weeks of lockdown people were like i'm having the strangest dreams of my life and i can't explain them i think um i've been very lucky 
timing wise uh and when first lockdown hit uh, i was saying just before we uh, went live that um i was writing the first draft of my next book and i had the synopsis chapter by chapter in front of me uh, in quite high detail because we worked on it for so much um and so really for me i just had to like type it out and make it work and then we've had this enormous break and then second lockdown i'm writing the second draft which is weird it's going to be a book that's written almost entirely sitting in a chair in my flat but... <laughs> So you're going to acknowledge the chair in your acknowledgements, right? Because I feel like dedicated to maybe. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I've even shamelessly, I've just realised I've gotten rid of the first chair. Like no gratitude. Just like, oh, oh my gosh! Oh, just used and abused. <laughs> oh, I like this. Uh, Ross is on the ball on Twitter. Give me a cheeky like when I was having a conversation about the book. You know, it makes a big difference having authors interact with people online. It's what I love about. Oh, thank you. Yeah, like I've seen as well, like uh, when people are reading the book for Believeathon or anything, and I love that you're so up for, you know, talking to people about it. I've always said as well, and you mentioned this before about YA authors, um, but like definitely, like I love it when people um, tag the author in a positive review, but when it's a yeah. negative review, please don't do that. <laughs> like, seriously, please don't. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I know not everyone's going to love every single book they've ever read, but like, don't tag the author in it. That's the. That's the thing. It was a weird, I remember listening to YA authors in particular talk about Goodreads and saying, mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, it's like it's quite uh, it's quite intense. And I thought, oh, that's weird. I've never I've always just found it quite nice. And I went on some of the Goodreads accounts of my like YA author friends. It was like, it's a different world. Like middle grades, just quite sweet and everybody's lovely. But young adult can be brutal. Yeah, yeah, it can. It can. And I do. Oh, it's I feel awful as well because I'm like with us being a book reviewer and I know a lot of people um write like reading or um these books and their uh, book blogging or booktubing, anything like that. It, it it makes it we do feel horrible, but like we're obviously like can love everything. But some people yeah. aren't like very respectful, I guess, like when they're doing reviews, like there can be some rant reviews. And I know I've done I hold my head up, well, hands up. I've done it in the past myself, but I would never do that for middle grade. Never, never. <gasps> I'm a nice person, I promise. And actually, my review for The Midnight Guardians is the top review on Goodreads. It was, I noticed. Yay. <laughs> it's because I was there first. I was there. I want to get in there first. Or at least I was one of them. Liking it from endless fake accounts. Oh, please do. <laughs> I love the interaction. <laughs> uh, oh, I do say some, like, questions in the comments as well um tracy's asked one there but i'll keep that for the midnight guardians uh, section so if anybody has any questions for us uh please let me know and i'll jump in with them usually i'd leave them until the end but then i'd end up asking them all during the interview and then now i've just you know i'm just going to pop them in every now and then so if anyone has any questions feel free to see and also aisha bushby's here hi hey, aisha how's it going how's it going yeah i hope you're having a good night hope you're having a good drink as well we deserve it well, yeah. Um, so, um, you did mention a couple of your books just before. You have you've actually done quite a lot. Um, what are some of the other ones that you you have? Uh, well, because you've also won uh, a it was a Cliff Carnegie Medal for one of them as well. Was, so, um, let me let me make sure I get it right. The first book, uh, Alex the Dog on the Edit Raw, that was the uh, that was shortlisted for the Costa Award, twenty thirteen. Um, and then I've had a few books that have been uh, nominated and long listed for the Carnegie or the Kate Greenaway. Um, I think that's right. That sounds about right, I think. Um, but uh, yes, I think the, I know Perigee in Me was, uh, which came out in 2016, that was long listed for the Carnegie. And I've done a couple of picture books with the illustrator David Litchfield, uh, who did The Bear and the Piano, uh, yeah. Lights on Cotton Rock. He's just amazing um and uh yeah i really enjoyed surfing off the back of his success that was great sounds about right <laughs> um oh um Tamar's asked what is your favorite country to visit H have you yeah. been abroad do you do you like going abroad oh my god i do it feels that question feels from like another lifetime ago that's amazing i do um so my girlfriend's family are greek um and so they do like an annual holiday to go back to uh, lesbos where they're all from um and so that means that i've 
it's probably the only chance in my life I have to like repeatedly visit a country. Um, normally, I guess I sort of want to try out a different place each time. I've never sort of done that repeat visit, but I have. I've really loved going back to Greece. Like that's been amazing. I can imagine. I genuinely can imagine. Also, I'm going to ask this question at the end. I, I I want to try and get this out of Ross, or at least like something out of Ross. So I will. This question will pop up. So prepare. Yeah. Because I know I don't want to get you in trouble with a publisher, of course, but we still want something, you know. <laughs> um, do you have any good luck items that you have when you're you're writing your book? Is there anything that you have always had? Good question. Hmm. You know what? I was about to say no, I don't, but I've realised that I've slightly like filled my house with just endless what I think are like good luck items. Let me see if I've got. Hang on. So I'm going to try and get like an array. That's a <laughs> Okay. It's going to be show and tell, everyone. We're going to have some show and tell here. I think so, we haven't done an interview yet, so this is great. <laughs> so these are just some that I've found. Uh, we've got a, a rinse wind model. This was, yeah. Wow. I mean, I bought that when I was like 14. That's just, it's not, it's not cool. Uh, it this is my childhood beloved toy. This is Frankie. He sort of sits over there. Uh, this is, I believe, a lion that's also a person. Uh, this is my granddad's pocket watch. Uh, this is a pig, because I worked on a pig farm for a while, and I just think they're the best animals ever. Uh, and this is, what was it? This was inspiration for um, Space Tortoise, uh, one of the pitch books with David Litchfield. It's like a little boat that's powered by a candle. You put a candle in there, and it heats up a little tank of water, and it makes it go forward. I just love it. Whoa. <laughs> that is... Yeah, you. You, you've stopped me. <laughs> but I feel like you've answered the question very well. Those are quite some good luck items there. Um, oh, are you reading anything at the minute as well? So I'm right in the middle of... Um, oh, you know what? I just realised I actually don't know how to pronounce the author's name. The, uh, a Letter for the King. Uh it's uh, by Pushkin Press, and it's quite like an old translation. I, I think the name is pronounced like Tanker. I'm not quite sure. But basically, it's like a proper old, like, high fantasy kids book um, that got republished about two years ago. And it's amazing. Like, I'm properly one of the best kids books I've ever read. And I'm tearing through that at the moment and stealing all of its ideas. <laughs> Good recommendation as well. It's oh, and it's, it's actually Timo's favourite middle grade. Hey, it's so good. The thing I'm trying to work out is I haven't heard, I know there's a sequel to it, but nobody's yeah. ever mentioned it to me. Um, and I'm trying to work out if there's a reason for that, if it's one of those things where the plot for A Letter for the King is just so, um, so incredibly driven. And I'm trying to work out if maybe like it really needs that backbone and the second one doesn't have it. So uh, if you've got any advice, let me know. Yeah, Tim. If you've read the second one, do more. Uh, so I would love to talk about the Midnight Guardians now, and I'm going to tie this in with Cece's question in the in the comments. Um, so, um, and before we talk about that as well, do you want to let people know who might not have read the Midnight Guardians yet what it's about? Maybe. Well, yeah, sure. So the Midnight Guardians. Uh, first of all, it's set uh, in December 1940, across eight days from the 21st of December through to the New Year. Um, so that is during uh, the period of time, the Blitz, uh, when cities and dockyards and factories all around Britain were being bombed almost every single night. Uh, the main character is a boy called Cole, who has been evacuated from London where he lives, uh, sent to live the other side of the country, uh, and who discovers that his old imaginary friends uh, called the Guardians, three characters that he invented and completely forgot about, uh, have come to life and uh, have given him a dire warning. Uh, so you can see them on that front cover. Uh, you have Pendlebury, who is a giant shape-shifting tiger. Uh, you can just about see, I know my camera's not got that great of focus, uh, Mr. Noakes, who's a badger in a dapper waistcoat. Uh, and then you have the King of Rogues, uh, who is a courageous knight in armour uh, with a bit of an attitude problem. Um, and it turns out that uh, unless Cole can get to London in seven days, his sister Rose uh, is going to be killed in the biggest raid on London yet. Uh, and so what takes place is a perilous quest 
across the length of Britain through the worst storms of the centuries to try and get to London before it's too late. Uh, and along the way, they're pursued by the Midwinter King, the Lord of all darkness, who has his own reasons for stopping Cole's quest. <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to go for the East Enders theme tune there, because people now will be in suspense and will read the book. So get your drunk read Get on that. Also, um, Tamar did say the sequel to um, the letter. Hey. Of so give it a try next time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, with the Midnight Guardians, like, how did the idea come about? Like, how was the planning? But also, I'll tie in with Cece's question because Cece asked, What do you say first, characters or moments in the book? Like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know what? Every single other book that I've written, it's always been moments every single time I'll have like a seed of a moment and go that would be incredible to write and I build a whole story around it normally even in the part of um the process where I'm just putting things together there's so much changing and rearranging and everything this book is the first and only time where I I can even find hang on I've got the new book where I wrote it down I literally sat down and the first thing that I wrote was those characters, the Guardians. And I remember at the time writing it and going, uh, you know what, I'm just going to take a stab, go, here we go. Uh, there'll be like a, a tiger called Pendlebury and um, a knight called the King of Rogues. And they were kind of like placeholder characters that I thought I'll come back and I'll actually decide what I want it to be. And they just stuck. I, I've never had that before. I've never just taken a punt and it's been the right thing to do. I think the only major change that I had was um, in the very first draft, the Pendlebury, the tiger, uh, was made out of uh, porcelain. She was like a giant porcelain tiger. And so during the quest, they all had to find plates to feed her because that's what she needed to keep her strength up. And my agent said, don't do that. <laughs> that's really bad. That Just don't do it. It's interesting. <laughs> it's it's there, and she was right. I'm glad I listened. Uh, it also would have made it quite perilous for Pendlebury as well, because I mean, could shatter at any moment, right? That was that was the plan. It was going to be that you know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I did want there to be moments where, like, they genuinely had to care about the fact that she was particularly fragile, despite being this big, strong character. But I think it's that. Um, I think what I've learned a lot with this book is uh, normally I get uh, really caught up with ideas and go, oh, and that'd be really interesting and that'd be really funny. And I think with this book, it's been the first time where I've been trying to write as much as possible from the gut um, and just going like, no, do what feels right. You know, don't try and come up with a really clever idea. Try and do something that feels like it's going to sort of like catch the reader emotionally um, without you having to noodle about with other stuff. Well, a lot of people have said in their reviews and things that it has been quite an emotional book, so well written. If it if it was come from the gut, then obviously it worked. It worked phenomenally. So that's that's oh, awesome. Thank you. Also, oh, <laughs> the date that you wrote those character things down. What was that? Was that twenty nineteen? Was that? Yeah, good spot. That's me. This was so originally the very first uh, working title. I wanted to call it Allies. Um, and that stuck for ages. Even when we were submitting, we were submitting it as allies. And that was uh, the 28th of December, 2017. Just there. 2017. Oh, my God. Yeah. I thought it was nine. Oh, my God. That's even... This has been in the works for quite some time then. It's, yeah. It's, I think it's not the longest I've written a book. Uh, I think the first book took me four years because um, I was doing it sort of on and off while, like, working. Um but I think in total, this has ended up being the longest I've consistently spent writing a book. Uh, I've never had to research for a book before. That's, you know, I, I represent historical fiction writers. It's really hard. I've never had to do it. A newfound admiration for what they do. That was actually going to be my next question, actually. It was like, what kind of plan went into this? Did you have to do a lot of research? Because it it feels very authentic to the time. So I didn't know if maybe you'd like read other books set in the same time period, maybe to get a feel of how other authors maybe try to, to capture that moment in time. Like, how did you manage to do Because I thought it was done brilliantly. So like, you obviously did right. So like, was it a long and arduous process of 
researching it? Yes. Um, I did all the above. Uh, and I think the, the thing that I always suspected would happen is that if you do loads of research, then you wear it a bit too heavily. Like you end up just like regurgitating all this stuff that you've read and that you find fascinating. And I think with the first draft, that was exactly how it came across. It was just me taking all of these like uh, sort of historical nonfiction books, but also like fiction set during the time and just throwing it out there. I think that um, I just did absolutely loads. I mean, I went to like the National Archives to look at bomb maps, to like chart where things were gonna happen. I read like loads of different quite specific descriptions of what was going on with things like, um, there's something I always wanted to put in the book, but I never did, which I think is amazing, which was that there was something called starfish sites, which was basically to try and confuse enemy planes uh, when they were bombing during blackout, they built fake towns like 10 miles outside of places like Bristol and then set them on fire so that planes flying overhead would go like, oh, look, you know, that's where they've bombed. So we'll keep bombing that. So they'd just be like weird fake houses like 10 miles outside of other cities. I just think that's so cool. Um, I and I never got it in the book. Oh. Um, but it's so interesting though I never knew that that's genuinely really interesting it's, I just think there's so much because it's one of those subjects that I feel like I've been learning about my whole life and I was like I can't there's just so much said about it there's nothing interesting to be found in this if you don't already you know if you haven't been taught about that for years but there's just so much stuff like um even that the starfish site thing reminded me that um the pathways around the white cliffs of dover they sprayed them with ink so that planes wouldn't be able to spot like okay well that's a chalk pathway so I just oh. covered them in ink it's weird <laughs> that's so cool though it, it is really interesting because as you said like i feel like learning about like world war ii and the blitz and even world war one as well it's taught very like well quite a lot in school i remember always learning about the wars and back then i probably didn't appreciate it as much as you do as an adult so yeah. it's why i love reading like children's books where the setting is with like a world war backdrop and i feel like it makes it quite an accessible moment in time for for children which i think is like another reason why the Midnight Guardians is like such a good one for kids to read if they want to learn. I mean, it's not like the be all end all of like learning about the Blitz or anything like that, but it does give you a sense of the panic and the fear and um, or like the hope that people had during that time as well. It's just like a like a perfect little package for for history. And I didn't realize as well actually, but in the published version, because I read the proof of it in the published version, there is actually in the back there are. Um, historical notes in oh, the of course yes yeah which i i didn't get a chance to read them because i they went in the proof but they they're, they're so cool like I'm, I'm gonna like read them after this and i'll probably learn more about it from that as well so that's really cool just another little interesting part of you know the experience of reading the story so you must have felt a bit pressure there to try and do the world war like scene justice really i think it's that um I, I think one of the one of the like moments that I think started making me want to write it was in I think around about the age of 30 I suddenly for the first time in my life went like hang on a moment like these aren't just like weird stories we tell each other this is stuff that actually happened um and like I've lived for in London for maybe the last 15 years of my life um and just trying to get my head around the idea of well so what people went into shelters and then everything got bombed and then you came up and went to work it didn't make any sense and I think trying to get my head around that was the thing that kind of set it in motion but I think I, I had also read a few quite old um, World War II books aimed at kids and I was finding it a little bit frustrating when it is portrayed as a period of time where everybody sort of knows what they're doing and uh you know everything's clear cut and right is right and wrong is wrong and i thought i just don't think it would feel like that i think if you it seems like that in hindsight but i think if you're in that moment and you didn't know the war was going to be won in several years i think it would feel very different 
And I think we do a disservice to that period of time if we don't look at it in those terms. That's what I wanted to do. That, no, that, that makes total sense because I feel like also now we are in a bit of a moment in time with everything that's gone on this year. We don't know how long it's mm. lasting. And it, it, obviously it's like probably not to the same scale or anything like that, but like for our generation, like what we're going through now, I feel like a lot of people can relate to, you know, the the mass the mass um, panic, the mass, um, the sense of community, like trying to come together during like a really hard time. And yeah, just try to get a bit of norm normality out of what's I think of that, it's sort of, because I think there's, um, every now and then you'll see somebody go like, you know, we didn't give up during the blitz and we shouldn't give up now. And people go, it's a very different thing. But I think it's the way that you respond to uh, a sort of nationwide crisis. Like, how do you react to this thing that everybody is going through in one way or another? Um, and I think that one of the most, like, reassuring things that I saw was um, there are actual articles sort of throughout the book um, that serve almost as, like, section headers to introduce what was going on in the news during those particular days. Um, and to get those, I went to the British Library and I found newspapers that were published those days. Um, and it was just it was so unbelievably helpful. Like, it was just the perfect insight into the fact that, you know, those newspapers were just filled with articles about people breaking the law and doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And literally, like, it was all about fining people who were just, like, refusing to do blackout because they were like, I'm not doing it. Like, why should I? It's like, well, you sort of have to. Like, and yeah, it's really inconvenient, but you sort of have to. Um, and I think I loved that. I liked that people weren't doing it then. You know, uh, people were still confused and uh, governments and councils were bungling things all the time. I mean, constantly. One of the really useful books that I read was by Juliet Gardner and it's called The Blitz. And it's mainly just about how how many mistakes were made during that period in history by the people in charge, which you'd never hear about. Um, and yeah, that was something I wanted to get in there, definitely. Nice. Now it makes me so much. I really want to now like research like, as well. Like it makes me want to learn more about it. So I feel like this is a good gateway into learning about that subject. So if teachers are watching this, they should you know teach it in classrooms, and then we'll get them reading for for World War Two and the Blitz and and all of that. Um. So, um, the I did actually want to ask why. Like, was there a, when you were sitting down thinking about you know the Midnight Guardians? Was it always going to be set during the Blitz? Like, was that always what was going to happen? Did you always know it was going to be historical and, and all that? Or, like, how did how did that come about? I think that the very first the very first idea that I got, even before I, like, wrote it down in my notebook, I don't think it was set during the Second World War. I liked the idea of, I think there was going to be, like, something quite um big and seismic in place and i think maybe when i first thought of it it was going to be set kind of now uh but maybe it, it, there was a war um and i think i realized quite early on that making it up just didn't have the same kind of emotional heft that sort of actually setting it during that period of time did and so i sort of went with it and i think as i the weird thing about writing is that you often don't know why you're doing stuff. And I think it only became apparent a year into writing it that I was like, no, I actually really care about writing about this period of history. And I didn't even realise it. Um, yeah, it's weird. Like, you read over a first draft and you go, I've written a book about this. And I didn't even realise I was writing about that. But it turns out I am. Wow, that's, that's a genius, mate. Because I know what you said before as well about the character. Because... Tracy did also ask, why did you choose the Badger and the Tiger for Men of Guardians? Like, what you said before about like, writing the characters down, did they just, like, stumble into your head? Like, was that just, you just can't really explain why? But just Honestly, that they... I've never, I've never had this before. Um, there are weird times when I'll realise, after I've written a book, that whenever I've been visualising scenes in my head, I'll go, oh, hang on, that's, that's my school. And I'd sort of hadn't even thought like, no, that whole scene is taking place in my school that I went to. And I hadn't even taken it into account. I realized that the book that I'm writing at the moment, I was thinking about it. I was like, I've set this in my girlfriend's house when I was 16. Like the girlfriend that I had then. I was like, I don't know why I've done that. That's kind of weird. Um, 
I think with the Guardians, I know since having to think about it, I think that the sort of seed of the idea for Pendlebury the Tiger was when I was about eight years old, I had a tiny porcelain mouse that was about as big as my fingernail. Um, and I was just amazed by how small and how delicate it was. And I think that I liked the idea of having this big creature that could become really small as well. And I think in my head, I just went mouse, tiger, and that just sort of made sense. For the badger, the only connection I can think of is that I've realised since I wrote the book that he really resembles my grandfather. Um, and actually, the house that my grandfather lived in, he had quite a lot of like stuffed toys of like, but quite sort of fancy ones. He had like a human sized stuffed fox in a fox hunting outfit, which is like, it was really creepy and it was really gross. And it sat at the top of the stairs. Like, okay, that's creepy. <laughs> yeah, it was not great. Um, but I think that, yeah, it was almost that of just sort of taking these ingredients that made sense and sort of taking bits of my grandfather and then mixing him with an animal. Um, and people just love badges, they're just great. They do, and uh, I just look. It's something. oh, you got one. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> it, it got it got delivered to the shop, and like I'd already had the proof. I'd already read it, but it came to the shop, and I was just like, I mean, I could give this to to somebody else who works um here, but I kind of want it for myself. <laughs> so I was really What's that over there. Yeah. Mine, <laughs> yeah, you've got to lay claim on it, otherwise, it'll be gone. Somebody else would have taken it. So, yeah, I took the notebook. I'm sorry if anybody's watching from work. I'm sorry, I've got like a rubber stamp with Mr. Noakes on it, so I'll just like I'll stamp anything. Oh, great, <laughs> yeah, make, I'll stamp that, I'll mail it to you. You're fine. <laughs> oh, that's kind of it. Um, so Jane was not British, uh, so is it hard to understand or read as a non British person? I and personally, I don't think it is. Like I think um Tamar's also on about the um the World War Two aspect of it. Like it's not I don't think this is like something that will teach you like it doesn't like it's not meant to teach you like like all of the facts about World War Two. It's just that there is context and I feel like it's embedded very well in the in the text. You only get told what you really need to be told. Um so I feel like I feel like yeah, it's it's absolutely fine if you're not British to understand the book. I, I definitely I tried to write it with that in mind of um you know I, I think there can be a tendency I think with um uh sort of British historical fiction to sort of think that you know oh everyone knows about our our lovely wars that we fought in um and so I think I wanted to really set the scene in a very specific bit of time where you didn't need uh, a lot of info going in and those kind of section headers that I have uh the plan with them was to just make it really really clear uh almost that you could go in with you know zero knowledge and it would still land and make sense hopefully yeah so you should still i still get a team out and i think you'd still love it uh so <laughs> you mentioned um call before i keep saying call I, I think that's just me being yeah but it's call call i reckon i think either could work you know it's weird i think um I know that I think I got the name because I had been I got the audiobook of Michael Sheen reading La Belle Sauvage by mm. Philip Pullman. Have you heard the audiobook? No, I haven't heard it, no. Oh my god. Like so I think I haven't actually read either of those new Philip Pullmans. And I think I wouldn't enjoy them so much if it wasn't for Michael Sheen's narration. It's like it's a masterclass. He's incredible. And the main character of that first book is called Malcolm. And I just loved, he brings that character to life. He's sort of a very practical, very sensitive kid. And I was just so won over by that, of like, that's what I want. I want this, like, gentle boy. So I just stole Cole. <laughs> and what you're saying in there as well is that you would love to have Michael Sheen in the adaptation, the film adaptation. of you know, I'm not going to demand it, but I'd just be really offended if he isn't. So... <laughs> <laughs> very fair um oh uh got a random question here as well actually um have you written or will you ever write adult books oh you know every now and then people have asked me this um i think that i just don't know if i'll be very good at it 
I think I would end up writing the exact same books that I write now, but I'd probably end up like putting a swear word in and have like a really bad sex scene and like that'll be it. Um, I've got a couple of ideas, but I, I suspect I might not be very good at it. Um, but watch this space. You never know. Don't put yourself down. That's the main takeaway from me. Don't put yourself down. You could probably write a fantastic adult book, but we won't know until you try. Exactly. <laughs> um, so with, because um, a lot of people, when I've been reading reviews, have absolutely loved the characters, um, especially like with the King of Rogues and like I've seen like the comedy, like the, the comedic side of this. There's just so many like different comedic parts to this, like, especially with the King of Rogues and not calling them just rogues. There's the whole tension between the characters because they're always kind of, I mean, they've got each other's best interest at heart and they do care for each other, but it's like, it's almost like a sibling relationship where you love each other, but at the same time you hate each other and you kind yeah. of, you're always at blows. Um, so yeah, what was it like writing them? Like where, like how did you manage to put all that character work into like a middle grade novel that really feels like authentic? Like were you thinking of any specific themes like, like with the friendship and the hope that the book brings? Like did you try and imbue that in the characters and that's why they each have very different personalities. Like I imagine it was very hard to write so many different characters in this book, especially imaginary characters as well. Like it's just so magical. And so I, yeah, it's kind of a weird question. No, no, I totally get it. I think um, I always knew that I wanted there to be like uh, that balance of contrasting sort of characters. And I like, I like books with gangs who are like bouncing off each other. Um, I think what it works well is just like, a joy to read. I think that the problem that I definitely noticed um, in all of my books is that if I put a load of characters into a room and I'm like, right, let's move this story forward, I get them arguing. Um, and I, it took me a few years to realize this, that I was reading books with characters who are nice to each other. I was like, oh no, this works. This is, you don't have to have people being horrible. I think that the, the, sides of the book to do with kind of um hope and uh the kind of more heartfelt side i think for me they tend to come later on in drafts um i know that when i start i'm really plot driven i'm really like dialogue and like joke heavy and i think that those first drafts can maybe be a little bit sort of lacking in sort of emotion and that kind of thing but that balance it is really tricky and there's honestly, I don't think there's any solution to it other than by just going over it again and again and again. Um, there's no replacement for just doing those hours of work. And I think um, it's definitely, I don't know if other authors have this. Uh, I'm sure if you're there, you, you might get this. Um, just forgetting how much work goes into each one every single time. You forget about the like hours of frustration and occasional despair and then when it's finally done you go oh that was fun i'll do another one um yeah i want to try and keep a diary like charting how i feel about things day by day so i can read it back the next time i do a book and go oh no i felt this way last time yeah it's, it's, it's like a circle it's like that ever, never ending circle every um, time <laughs> if we didn't forget we wouldn't do it again yeah there we go, that's it <laughs> that's hilarious uh, well speaking of like the comedic side and like how you can like be quite joke heavy and things i feel like, with this book as well it can be quite frightening especially with yeah. the midwinter king like i feel like he is one of the best like villains of like villains of each other this year he's very it's just it's quite scary and like ominous and there's like that sense of suspense mixed in with the setting of world war ii it's like it all adds to the atmosphere. So with this being a, a book for children, like how did you handle those darker aspects? Because I think this is probably your darkest book so far, right? So mm. you must have been going a bit out of your comfort zone now to kind of bring that balance out. You know what? I think that I've always, always, always ended up wanting to write these scary passages that are in there. And again, I think that's a Terry Pratchett thing. I think it comes from wanting to find a way to balance like stupid jokes with actually like something that lands very differently. Um, what normally has happened is that I've in past books is that when I've tried to include it, 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 it hasn't really worked tremendously well. 
Um, and I think with some books that you can read them now and the evidence is there. It just doesn't quite work as well. Um, with this one, I think it just seemed to fit. And I think it's maybe one of the reasons why it didn't get edited out. Um, in fact, he wasn't the Midwinter King. There was no baddie in the first draft. Um, it was Cole going on this quest with his guardians and, you know, all the incidents and the war. And um, my editor said, you know, this isn't enough. They need to be pursued. There needs to be something after them. Um, and I think the first idea I came up with was them being followed by like a bounty hunter kind of figure. Um, and I came up with this character and I called it the Black Rider. Uh, and then I handed in that draft and then immediately picked up the dark is rising and open to like page 80 and the baddie is called the dark rider and i just literally i just stolen it like entirely um but yeah so then i think i went on a bit of a quest to push it as much as i possibly could um and to make it really genuinely frightening because i think that that's that's what i want out of books i want books that have jokes but that can also handle terror as well they're my favorite yeah, and I feel like with the Midwinter King as well, he represents so much. I mean, it's probably just me because I, I did English literature at uni. I, you know, put meaning into every single thing. You probably didn't mean it. But no, like, no, no, no. <laughs> I thought, yeah, and then you're going to say, yes, I did mean that. But like Midwinter King, he definitely represents kind of with like the fear of London and uh, with the Germans dropping bombs on London and all that fear, I feel is just like so uh, embodied in the Midwinter King. And then with the pursuit of, you know, calling the imaginary friends and then, you know, um, the whole deadline before he ends up escaping and creating havoc upon the whole world and um, escaping the spirit world. And there's just like so much built into that that I feel like you could compare it with, you know, the Blitz and the bombing of London and um, people's feelings towards um, terror in that time as well. So you definitely did that. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah, I nailed it. I say I, I just read so well. I, I can say exactly what you mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is a really lovely um, comment. Um, so it's all your kids' books on Amazon in the cart right now. Whoa! Hey, get that ad revenue. <laughs> uh, so uh, what was the process? Because you, right, I, well, um, I'll ask a couple more questions and then I'll ask one final question and then I'll let you go because I know it's past both of our better times. Um, and it, <laughs> anybody has any questions do let us know but um with this one because it like you have published quite a few beforehand was it the same kind of deal with this one did you have this idea and presented it to your agent or was did you have like a contract to like write a new book or what how did you manage to make this happen as a reality from getting it like written to being actually published so all of my books up until uh this one um, have been published by Faber and Faber um, and I've been with them since uh, I think they signed me in 2011 something like that um, and I think after my last book with them which was called Max and the Millions uh, I had a go writing or sort of trying out a few drafts of stuff for them uh, and just nothing was really working nothing was landing I do think I had actually written a sort of one sentence pitch of the Midnight Guardians like a very early version and sort of put it past them and it was just quite early on and it didn't you know i think they were like yeah, maybe but then we didn't do it and i think with this one um i felt like it was a strong enough book that actually i really wanted to get it written uh and we ended up uh taking it in i think it was i wrote about ten thousand words uh and a synopsis and we took it to a couple of publishers uh it got bought by walker books but one of the things that it was sort of reliant on was we had quite a big meeting where I was actually explaining, like, here's what I want to do with this book, because there is a lot going on in it. Um, that there's, you know, all this mythology and folklore, but then all of the Second World War stuff that's in there. And I sort of had to just argue my case a bit and sort of explain why there was so much different stuff that's in there. Um, and uh, And they kind of took a punt on it based on that, um, which again, I think is really lucky. Um, I know that having a book bought off the first 10,000 words is not that common. It does happen, but it's not that common. Um, 
but uh, yeah, they've bought uh, another one off me uh, based off of that, uh, which is the one that I'm writing at the moment. Uh, and we're working on a couple of other things at the moment uh, that may be around at some point in the future. Oh, that's all you're hearing. No, we need to hear more. We just want, well, I mean, I was going to save it till the end. I'll ask it now, but like, you said you're working on something. Like, is there anything at all you can possibly tell us of what it is you're working on? Is it still going to be fantasy? Is it still going to be children's? Is it like, I mean, obviously it's not going to be at all because you said, but like, is it like, can you just say anything at all? Like, anything, bare bones, anything I can grab my teeth into? So, uh, it's sort of, um, it's meant to feel like it could sit alongside the Midnight Guardians. Uh, it's not a historical novel. Uh, it's aimed at the same age range, so sort of 8 to 12. Um, it's still quite imbued with folklore and the imaginary side of things. Um, but the interesting thing with this one is I handed the first draft in and uh, they came back to me and said, this needs to be scarier. You have to push scary in this one which i thought they'd ask me to kind of like rein it back a little bit but yeah so that's my job in this second draft is really like making it a frightening book uh it's about a boy whose uh baby sister is stolen by an evil fairy and sort of taken into almost like an evil version of the village where he lives uh, and he has to fulfill a number of sort of tasks in order to try and like get her soul back effectively um and yeah so i'm making that scary oh i'm so excited I'm, and the fact that they've taught you to make it scarier whew. i'm in heaven i love it I, I love that as well i can't wait i can't wait we'll have to i mean i've got ross's um twitter in the description box i'm sure you'll probably update everyone on when that's coming out like any more information about that Shiny, I know it's going to be around about this time next year. Uh, I think possibly October, November, something like that. At the moment, it's called Changeling. But, uh, that might oh, that's so exciting. Oh, but that's ages away, though. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Like, do, you th uh, do you think since you wrote your first kids' book that uh, kids have come to expect what's going on? I mean, not all of your books have been scary. There have been some like very like light-hearted ones, right? Oh, um, yeah. It just seems like now now i feel like i'm not now that i'm expecting it from you from now on but like i'm expecting brilliance i mean no pressure no, yes yes because you can't you can do it you can do it well um sorry yeah, like, what's really interesting is um i think scary books are the things that kids don't get given enough of mm. i just honestly i've done so many school visits and whenever i've told them you know oh i wrote a book of short scary christmas stories they all go like, yes, amazing. They're not given them. Um, I think teachers feel weird about reading them a lot of the time. Parents don't necessarily want to. Booksellers often feel like, oh, if I end up recommending this, then, you know, they get upset. The kids want scary books um, and they just don't get enough. That's true. Uh, when I was a kid at primary school, my form teacher, so I, I mean, saying like, yeah, four maybe, he would read us all the Goosebumps books. Brilliant. Uh, that's where my love for Goosebumps came and where my love for being scared as a child came. So I definitely feel like, yeah, I think you're on the right path there. Like a lot of kids do want that reaction because it's a safe scare kind of thing. So Perfect, yeah. Where else are they going to learn how to handle being frightened of stuff? Like you don't want to do that in real life, but you can do it at a theme park or in a book. I just think it's brilliant. Book, in a movie. All of that. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, so last couple of questions. I mean, I was going to ask the one about what's coming next, but we'll have to ask it ASAP. I'm impatient. I'm impatient. Um, there is another one, if that helps. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> I've got a couple of picture books that are also coming out with Walker. Uh, and the first one is coming out next year. It's a rhyming picture book that I've written, uh, illustrated by Sarah Warburton, uh, who did Dinosaurs in the Supermarket. Uh, and it's called Ten Delicious Teachers. Uh, and it's about 10 teachers who go skipping through a forest and get picked off by monsters one by one uh, in, in a sort of funny but also sinister way. Our students are going to love that. <laughs> I really, I'm, I'm so excited about it. I'm excited about that now because I, I get a lot of teachers coming into my uh, bookstore 
And I feel like, yeah, you should make your kids read this book because then it might make them appreciate you a bit more. They might not want you to be picked off one by one. I don't know. But I think there's a few jokes in there for teachers as well. They'll know. They'll know when they see it. <laughs> Good. I can't wait for that. Um, so with the um, Water Songs Book of the Month, when did you find out about that? How how did you find out about that? And did you celebrate? Oh my god. So this is I mean, for me it's it's like a it's a dream for me. It's um it's something that I've wanted for a very long time. Um and uh I just think it's it's just a great scheme. I think it's brilliant. Um and uh I think when we I'm trying to remember when it would have been. I think that the original release date was supposed to be September. Uh, and I think one of the reasons it got pushed back was because we realised, well, actually, there's, you know, this might work really nicely as a Christmas ebook of the month. Uh, and I think we took a punt on it and it, it and it paid off. Um, and it was the best thing ever. And I've been drunk ever since. I haven't stopped. <laughs> it's been four months. I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah, you're still going now with, with uh, your concoction that you have right now um uh, that's hilarious <laughs> so on release day um shops were still open so did you uh, manage to visit a couple on release day i it was so unfortunate i because that lockdown got announced fairly quickly i think it was on the saturday and on the sunday it got announced as book of the month um in my head i sort of planned all of november going to bookshops signing loads you know talking to booksellers and I, I was not able to do that on the Monday or Tuesday. And then everything was closing on the Thursday. So Wednesday, I just went into central London and I hammered bookshops like a man possessed. Um, but what I have been doing since is, uh, I know loads of signed book plates have gone out to Waterstones all around the country and any sort of independent booksellers as well. Uh, if you get in touch, I've been signing book plates, sending out bookmarks. Um, just really nice to you know basically do all the stuff that I would have been doing normally yeah and when everything's back open again you can hit those bookshops again i am not going to go out gracefully i'm just <laughs> going to be like dragged out of bookshops screaming <laughs> oh that's well, great that's it's what i'd expect from you from now i feel like we've learned so much about you in this interview this is this is your character <laughs> <laughs> you um so last question and this is like a probably a really horrible one uh so looking back on all of your books now and this is the same kind of thing as asking who your favorite child is oh, would you say your favorite audience is your favorite child i think every single author that i've ever had this conversation with has always ended up saying that their favorite book is the one that they finished most recently and i think it's genuinely because you do forget the process of writing you know it's like what Aisha and I were saying earlier you just forget it and that can be really nice when if I go into a school and they've asked me to talk about a book that I wrote five years ago I'm reading it almost for the first time going oh yeah like oh that's quite good or you know that's that needs fixing that sort of thing whereas this still feels fresh and I still feel like all of those characters I've sort of got to know them at the moment I think it's my best book on a on an objective level um i am excited about this next one that i'm writing but um it's weird i often feel you need about two years after a book's come out to really understand what you made um and it, i you know it could be that midnight guardians ends up being you know the, the the best book that i write and everything after that is kind of you know good but this is the one no i'm so excited for the changeling one now so excited if i'm not on the proofs list for that i'll be having words for I'll have words i'll have words I will throw a tantrum. I, I'm not above that. <laughs> well, <It's streaked. laughs> literally, I do get like so upset and offended when I'm like not the first choice, which I know like I shouldn't be anyway. But like when I'm not the first choice for a proof, or I see somebody else get a proof of something, and I'm like, I would have loved that. Why don't I have that already? And then I just deny people. So it's all good. <laughs> I got like loads of proofs got sent out. And I noticed people having sort of receiving them online. And I was like, oh, man, like, I thought I'd get some of those. And I got all of them, like, in one job lot. Like, there was obviously a problem with my post office that I just got in one day, like, 15 books. Like, wow. Oh, right, fine. Oh, well, this is definitely one of my prized possessions now. Um, 
So when this is like a hundred million selling book, got the proof as well. It's nothing. Stop it. <laughs> well, I guess that's the end of the interview now. So thank you uh, so much, everyone, for tuning in. This will be kept up on my channel. So anybody who's you know watching this in the future, thanks for watching. And thank you, a huge, huge, huge thank you to Ross for doing this with me. Thank you for spending your Sunday night chatting about you and your books. It must have been oh, thank you for having me on. It's been brilliant. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I've had fun. So yeah, uh, thank you so much, everyone. And yeah, I will say see this interview as soon as possible. And don't forget to buy the Midnight Guardians all of Ross's books. I have Ross's socials linked in the description. Go follow him, go check him out. Uh, and hope you enjoy the Believe as well. So thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.